This is Kim Jong-un, ruler of North Korea. He's just 36 years old, but he commands the world's fourth largest military. He has nuclear weapons, and his family has ruled over their people using violence and terror for over 70 years. But Kim is a man torn between two worlds. The traditions of his brutal communist past and the need to become a legitimate modern leader. That is his dilemma. Am I going to come out and become a cleaner, softer dictator? Or am I going to continue to retain this criminal regime that I inherited from my grandfather and my father? And that dilemma, you know what? It could be the end of the Kim dynasty. Kim Jong-un is only the third man to rule North Korea. He is following his grandfather and father in the role of supreme leader. They rule over their people as gods. In the 10th year of his rule, Kim Jong-un is at a crossroads. He's a dictator with a decision to make. Should he try to drag North Korea into the modern world and become a legitimate country, but risk losing his grip on power? Or should he continue to run a rogue state like his grandfather and father before him? If I compare it to a movie, I would say it's Godfather Three, And that's when Michael Corleone wants to become a legitimate businessman and head of a business conglomerate out from the, uh, the, the shadows of the mafia regime that he in inherited. But without the mafia state, the Kim regime would not function. Why? Because it is under heavy sanctions, the only way that it can make hard currency is by illicit trade. The North Korean regime is, in many respects, a huge criminal cartel. Guns, drugs, counterfeit cash, and cybercrime bring in an estimated $2 billion a year for Kim to spend. That's his personal piggy bank, and that is the way the Kim Jong-un regime is sustained. Recently, Kim has shown signs of modernizing. He's been stepping out with his first lady and meeting other world leaders. But in 2017, he was dragged back into his family business. This is his elder half-brother, Kim Jong-nam, who was overlooked for succession. He left North Korea for a quiet life in China, surfacing on camera from time to time to speak out against the regime. 
But then it seemed Kim Jong-nam crossed a line. During the course of my reporting, I was told by a person uh, with good connections to the intelligence community in the United States that Kim Jong-nam had, in fact, been an informant to the CIA and was supplying information about Kim Jong-un to them. These CCTV images show him meeting his suspected handler. A fascinated news media shadowed his every move. He still had very good connections to the regime. So for the CIA to be able to recruit Kim Jong-nam as an informer and to get whatever information he had, it would have been a huge deal for them. This would also have been considered very treasonous by Kim Jong-un. It seems the time had come for Kim to deal with his older brother. February 13th, 2017. Kuala Lumpur International Airport. Kim Jong-un's brother enters the terminal unaware that two female assassins are also at the airport. Now, for the first time on television, one of the assassins tells her full, extraordinary story. It begins with her being recruited by a man who claimed to be a TV producer. Pada waktu pertama saya kenal James itu orangnya uh, baik, terus kayak lucu juga kan, ikut uh, syuting, nggak tanya ikut syuting gimana, saya bilang kan, syuting kayak buat lucu-lucuan gitu, lucu-lucuan gimana, kayak gimana ya, terkenal kayak bum-bum prank. Jadi saya juga mikirnya, oh ya udahlah gitu. For months. Kim Jong-un's agents groom City and another young woman to ambush unsuspecting members of the public and smother their faces with cosmetic creams in what they thought were hidden camera show stunts. Saya kerap dan sering itu melakukan prank dipakai hand body dan uh, pakai uh, baby gitu baby oil gitu. Jadi saya rasa uh, yeah, seperti biasa aja, gitu. City's handler arranges a meeting at a cafe in the airport. There, she is to receive details of the target. Terus pas hari hanya kan, kebetulan kan memang di KLA kan lumayan rame. Nanti kalau misalnya kalau kamu uh, acting yang ini ya katanya uh, bagus ini nanti uh, kemungkinan bos juga akan kasih kamu bonus lagi. Uh, dia ke saya dan bilang e, itu orangnya gitu. Pas tuh saya bilang yang mana gitu kan. Itu yang pakai jaket warna abu-abu, katanya gitu kan. Yang mana? Itu, oh, yang botak, bilang kan. Kasih, oh ya gitu, saya uh, ke tangan saya, gitu. This time, it isn't baby oil, but a deadly nerve agent. 
As Kim Jong-un's brother heads to his flight, the two women make their move. Langsung kayak mengamuk gitu, habis ngamuk, saya juga gerogi. Cepat mungkin kan meninggalkan juga, ya udah aku juga buru-buru. Seeking help, Kim Jong-nam heads for the airport's medical facility. So at this point, Kim Jong-nam is in the infirmary, and he is behind the door. And this is where this image gets very scary. There's a gentleman in all black walking um, near this door, OK? And he's got a rolly suitcase. He's checking in to make sure that Kim Jong-nam is receiving medical treatment. This is one of the operatives. It's a very elaborate operation. It's very old school. The operation plays out like a Cold War spy caper. There are lookout men, a chemist to handle the nerve agent, a getaway driver and a team leader, codenamed Grandpa. The young women have no idea what they've done. They are soon apprehended by the local Malaysian police. Polisi juga nanya-nanya apa yang kamu lakukan di uh, uh, airport itu. Emangnya kenapa saya bilang kan? Terus polisi itu tiba-tiba bangun, uh, kamu tahu nggak apa yang kamu lakuin katanya? Kamu itu terlibat pembunuhan oleh adiknya presiden. The trial creates shockwaves around the world. She's been charged for the most serious crime in the country, the crime of murder. For the offense of murder, there's only one punishment, and that is death, by hanging. Soon, the chemist of the gang is also apprehended. He is caught on camera getting his story straight with North Korean embassy officials. This video evidence helped to build a picture of a ruthless political assassination. Both women were released after spending two years in prison. Sebelum kejadian ini terjadi, saya nggak tahu menau tentang King Jong Un. Nggak nyangka bisa sejauh ini uh, terlibat uh, kena uh, terlibat kasus. <laughs> Kim Jong-un's troublesome older brother was no more. Kim Jong-un's half-brother died in such a terrible, um, humiliating way on camera. And Kim probably was very pleased that he was able to watch all of this. Amid sobering scenes broadcast around the world, Kim Jong-nam's body is brought back to North Korea. It's accompanied by the same men spotted in the airport on the day he was murdered. It was absolutely to send a message to do in such a public way to everybody in North Korea and elsewhere that Kim will find you. understand Kim Jong-un, 
it's helpful to know the world he grew up in. Deep beneath the surface of North Korea, his father created an elaborate hidden kingdom that his children inhabited. North Korea has a separate parallel geography that exists outside of anything North Korean citizens would know about. It's a secret network that includes roads, railways, and tunnel systems. It's a way of concealing Kim's whereabouts from spy satellites. Currently, we're looking at Kim Jong-un's Kangdong VIP complex. Kangdong complex is one of the favorite complexes of the Kim family. Kim Jong-un spent a lot of time there as a child. So this is a portal tunnel. We can see the tunnel entrance. There's a road that goes under the Taedong River. So what Kim Jong-un could do is, instead of going across that bridge, uh, he would go through that tunnel, and that tunnel would take him under the Taedong River into tunnels under mountains to some unknown locale. And I call it the road to nowhere. It's believed there are some 8,000 tunnels in North Korea, reaching up to 1,000 feet below the surface. Some tunnels are thought to extend more than 30 miles, including an emergency escape route into China. So basically, Kim Jong-un can work in his office, uh, take an elevator to a sub-basement level, uh, get into a small motorcade, drive underground. And that explains a lot about Kim Jong-un's personality. Kim Jong-un grew up like that. This has been his entire life. The early years of Kim Jong-un's childhood indoctrinated him in the ways of the Kim dynasty. Kim Jong-un grew up in this extremely dysfunctional, paranoid, secretive family. It was impossible for Kim Jong-un to be a normal child. He was named the little general. He had a real cult pistol. You know, he had real generals bowing to him. His father was Kim Jong-il, one of the most notorious dictators in history, a man with a passion for banquets, cognac, and Bond movies. Kim Jong-il was generally paranoid. Around this period of time for Kim Jong-un, there's a lot of restrictions on his movements and activity, and they have to bring in playmates. Well, you'd think they'd bring in other seven or eight-year-old children, but you're, you're starting to talk about 30 or 40-year-old bodyguards. And so Kim Jong-un grows up very close to his bodyguards um, because these are his playmates. Of all of Kim Jong-il's bodyguards, only one is known to have escaped North Korea. The bodyguard also remembers the current ruler of North Korea. 정훈이도 보고, 정철이 보고, 여정이도 보고. 별장에 나왔는데 그땐 자식 작잖아요. 그러니까 그게 비밀적으로 유지하고 김정훈은 집안에서 같이 해서 몇십 하나 나서 오늘 6년, 5, 6년 됐잖아요. 
다른 애들하고 만나는 일이 없으니까. 제가 생각해보면 은 많이 외로웠죠. Today, Kim Jong-un still surrounds himself with these bodyguards. He has expanded the program, adding an elite unit to handle internal threats. The guys that protect him, despite the fact that they wear suits, these people are very similar to um, SAS or Navy SEALs in terms of their skills and training. They inspect his food. If you had a sack of rice, that sack of rice is scrutinized and inspected for any irregular grains. And so every bag of rice is a perfect bag of rice. They bring his toilet. There is a, a portable toilet. Because they don't want a foreign intelligence agency getting a hold of his feces and then analyzing the blood contents for whatever diseases he might have. So Kim Jong-un's psychology is deeply rooted in his father's totalitarian regime. But there is another side to Kim's experience, his school days in the West. Kim Jong-un is changing his country with a new style of leadership. It includes photo ops, North Korean style. Many think he's been influenced by the time he spent as a teenager in Switzerland. Living in the care of his maternal aunt and uncle, Kim Jong-un attended a regular public school in Bern. My name is Nikola Kovacevic, and um, well, I know Kim Jong-un from my school in Switzerland. So um, this is pretty much Un as I remember him wearing a typical uh, sports outfit, very American. He was wearing Chicago Bulls shirts, shorts, and Michael Jordan shoes. We were quite impressed by that. We were playing basketball, and Un was looking for people to play with. I'll never forget him with a, you know, cheeky smile on his face, you know, at the basketball court. We pretty much just played constantly. He was very, very passionate. You could clearly see that he wants to win. He was very good, very quick. He was on a completely different level than um, you might think uh, by looking at the pictures from today. We all liked having him, him in our team. We did have uh, interesting uh, chats about North Korea. There was one occasion where uh, I was just asking something like, how is it there? And I remember him saying that North Korea is, um, is very, very advanced. It's going to be a uh, big player in the future. You can definitely say that he was proud of his country. really enjoyed kind of the life of being a rich kid in Europe. He saw NBA games in Paris. He went off skiing in the Swiss Alps. But back in North Korea, there are changes inside the family. Kim Jong-un's mother is dying of cancer. 
which means Kim's aunt and uncle are about to lose their connection to the dynasty. Fearing they may be cast aside, they decide to act. Slipping out of the house under cover of darkness, his aunt and uncle take refuge in the U.S. Embassy. Claiming political asylum, they are spirited away to a military base in Germany. Kim Jong-un was at home. They did not say goodbye. They left him in the middle of the night. It must have been an extremely traumatic experience for Kim Jong-un to be abandoned like that. After debriefing by the CIA, Kim's aunt and uncle are given new identities, flown to the US, and vanish from sight. For the past 20 years, they have been living this completely anonymous life in middle America, running a dry cleaners. So nobody knows their true identities. But journalist Anna Fifield tracked them down and arranged a meeting. I did not expect them to show up. And even like that morning when they called to say they're on their way to where we'd agreed to meet, you know, I, I was surprised when they showed up. Kim Jong-un's aunt walked into the cafe. Like, I caught my breath because she looked exactly like her sister, Kim Jong-un's mother. And I spent the entire weekend with them talking about Kim Jong-un, uh, about, you know, what he was like as a child. And they described him as a normal kid who was a little bit misunderstood. Quite strange. I distinctly remember sitting on the couch there with them. At the time, Kim Jong-un was launching missiles. The projectile was fired from a 2,000-ton submarine, and South Korean military officials believe the missile's rocket booster did ignite. There's Kim Jong-un in a submarine looking at missiles, and the uncle said, oh, they never say anything good about him. Kim Jong-un never completes his studies in Europe. Age 17, he's recalled to North Korea. Within a decade, Kim will find himself the supreme leader of the most repressive dictatorship on Earth. He had lived in the West. He had seen freedom up close. So when he took over, a lot of people thought that he would be a reformer. And in fact, early on in his tenure, he stood up and he said that North Koreans would never have to tighten their belts again. So if he wants to remain in power for decades, he can't just hold on like his father did. He really has to show an improvement in the standard of living inside North Korea. Kim Jong-un is the only ruler of North Korea to have lived in the West. And his time in Switzerland left its mark on the supreme leader. Kim Jong-un, in the early years of his rule, I saw this desire for his country to be more worldly, for his people to be more worldly. In 2012, Kim ordered the construction of a ski resort near his capital, Pyongyang. More alpine centers followed, complete with all the après ski parks. I was one of the first foreigners to visit 
a little piece of Switzerland in North Korea. I could see the wheels turning in Kim Jong-un's head. Around that time, there was a lot of hope and speculation that this would be a moment for a very different type of North Korea. Kim builds his citizens theme parks and shopping malls, all in the name of North Korea's bright economic future. So we see the development of things like amusement parks, high-end restaurants, department stores. All of these things are also part of the Kim brand. It's designed to show his people that Kim is going to move the country forward. In the drive to rebrand his kingdom, Kim has an ally, his celebrity wife. Ri sol was a famous singer in North Korea. She would be instantly recognizable to any North Korean who's ever watched TV. In 2018, Kim changes his wife's official title from comrade to first lady. She has a very distinct role. She's very much like the Kate Middleton of North Korea. She is there to kind of humanize her husband, but also the two of them together are supposed to be a kind of modern, aspirational couple. They're showing the future of North Korea. Leading North Korea into the future presents Kim with another challenge. In a digital age shaped by the internet and social media, Kim is under pressure to ensure his people aren't left behind. If he's gonna rule for decades to come, he has to build his loyalty base. He wants to woo his generation. So he started experimenting with internet access, uh, expanding cell phone access. Those are all monumental changes for a country like North Korea. Recently, Kim has gone further, authorizing North Korea's very own social media stars. This is where a big concert is going to take place. Uh, the occasion is to celebrate the music. They even have their own influencers now. What they are portraying is a socialist fairyland. It's just absolutely amazing. And it's so carefully cultivated. Their role is to seduce people, to fall in love with the country. It's a smart strategy, but on the other hand, Access to information is one of the most dangerous things for a leader like Kim Jong-un. Because if people see what life is like outside North Korea, the illusion could be broken. And that, of course, for Kim Jong-un, is terrifying. For 75 years, the Kim family has relied on strength and terror for their survival. As Kim Jong-un attempts to transform himself from godlike tyrant to an approachable human leader, he needs backup within the family to maintain the dynasty's grip on power. But who can he rely on? Around 2001, Kim Jong-un's father takes a train across Russia. The Russian ambassador is having conversations with him and he asks him about succession. 
And he asked Kim Jong-il, who are your favorites as successor? And Kim Jong-il said, well, my sons are all idle blockheads, okay? It's my daughters that have the heart and intellect and mindset to be in politics. Born four years after Kim Jong-un in 1988, Kim Yo-jong is nicknamed the Sweet Princess. Until the death of her father in 2011, Kim Yo-jong's existence was a closely guarded secret, even inside North Korea. After Kim Jong-il died, with the succession of her brother, there was probably a conversation, do you want to do this? Do you want to be involved in the nitty gritty of North Korean politics? Some people don't have the ice in their veins to do it. Some people do. She said yes, and that's where we find ourselves today. Quietly, Kim Yo-jong rose through the ranks to become her brother's propaganda chief. In 2018, he deployed his sister on her first foreign assignment, a mission inside enemy territory. It was a really huge occasion when Kim Yo-jong arrived uh, into South Korea because she was the only member of the Kim family who had arrived in the South since the Korean War ended in 1953. So it was a really big deal. The occasion was the Winter Olympics, dubbed the Peace Olympics, as athletes from North and South Korea competed together for the first time. There was an ice hockey game where the two Korean teams joined together as one, and she was in the stands in the VIP section. I was able to walk down to see her in the flesh. She was very kind of enigmatic. She always had this kind of sphinx-like smile on her face. She said very little. So she became a real object of fascination uh, at that time amongst South Koreans. But Kim's sister hasn't just come south of the border to show face. With the eyes of the world on her, she opens peace talks with the South Korean leadership. Kim Yo-jong is becoming indispensable to the family firm. She is the one that approves all the media and press and writing that comes out in English in North Korea. Any piece of paper and any email that gets directed to Kim Jong-un is most likely viewed by her. And that's a critical thing to have. The sweet princess isn't only Kim Jong-un's right-hand woman. Recently, she's become a deadly player in her own right. I believe there have been people that have been shot on the orders of Kim Yo-jong. That's Kim Yo-jong's psychology. She's a shark. In the sign of her growing power, in 2020, Kim Jong-un promotes his sister over his own generals to the highest level of the Politburo. Kim Yo-jong's prominence has dramatically increased in 2020. The thing that's most striking is she's gone from a role of being in the background to actually being a voice of the regime. Kim's sister goes on the attack, 
threatening South Korean activists who continue to drop propaganda leaflets over the border. She is the only individual who has been able to put out a personal opinion in North Korean state media. Even the leader himself very rarely is going to express any sort of personal opinion. This means that she has a unique, special, and privileged role in the North Korean regime. Amid rising tensions between North and South Korea, in June 2020, Kim Yo-jong sends South Korea a message. Blowing up the government complex used for talks between the two sides. Korean experts say the explosion was designed to cement the growing power of Pyongyang leader Kim Jong-un's younger sister, Kim Yo-jong. In recent years, state media has referred to her as a central party cadre, indicating her tightening grip on power. This year, she took over some of her brother's roles in party affairs and foreign relations. Sources suggest she is now the real power holder in Pyongyang. Now she is continually, even outside of her actual rank and position, bashing uh, South Korea and the United States. This is a role that normally is reserved only for the Supreme Leader. It's classic North Korean provocation. It seems Kim is on his way to resolving his dilemma, how to modernize the country without losing control. The answer, a dual dictatorship. His sister keeps order with the traditional tools, fear, aggression, and discipline. While Kim reinvents himself as a modern politician with a kinder, gentler image. We have to remember when we're talking about Kim Jong-un, his main aspiration and his main focus as a leader right now is resetting the North Korean political system so that he becomes more above the fray and doesn't necessarily have to sign off on any individual public execution. Kim Jong-un does not want to be seen as a person who criticizes and bad mouths, you know, other leaders. So he leaves the dirty work in some respects for Kim Yo-jong to do. Kim Yo-jong is the bad cop. Uh, Kim Jong-un gets to look like a cool-headed leader. But in his bid to secure the dynasty and hang on to power, Kim is only halfway to the summit. To transform North Korea into a truly modern society, he must step onto the global stage and bring an end to seven decades of isolation from the outside world.